and I think even during the like the coming out of the pandemic in its in its in Australia recent recent times in its worst times when we're still coming out of lockdowns and everything, talking with friends about by this stage I'd done a bit of research and was presenting um, alternative ideas to people, and just the um, just the the aggression and the emotion that would come from nowhere just for raising the topic, you know, I'm just want to have a discussion about this, you know? Yeah. Um, and I've seen it with other people too, like who just want to talk about it and it's just shot down in this like vehement kind of, how dare you talk, you know, like that's, it's like a witch hunt or something, you know, yeah. like you, you can't even talk about it. And that, that's what really upsets me. It's like, what, what kind of society are we living in when we can't even just have these nuanced discussions around, what we're experiencing, you know, um, what my story is and what your story is, as opposed to, no, you're wrong, I'm right, kind of stuff. So, Dave, thank you for agreeing to speak today. Can you just paint a picture of, of what life was like for you um, before COVID? Yeah, sure. So, um... I'm, I call myself a filmmaker, so I shoot and edit video predominantly. Um, I'm 44 years old and I've been doing this as a freelancer for about 10 years. Um, been in the industry for about 20, I suppose. Um, so life, uh, was good. I, I live in, um, just the Northern suburbs of Melbourne and, uh, with my, my lovely partner and we rent a house and, um, we have a nice front yard and you know, it's, it's the suburban lifestyle. It's good. We like it. Um, yeah. And I was getting lots of work and right up until March, 2020, when, um, the pandemic came to Australia, I was in the thick of it work-wise. And, um, I have lots of different employers as a freelancer, you know, I probably got a dozen or more employers and I was working for one of them at a large event and yeah, it all came to a grinding halt. And um, so that was March 2020. How did you find the lockdowns in Melbourne? Well, I was one of the lucky ones, I think, because um, my partner and I are very used to hanging out at home together all the time anyway. Um, she's an artist and doing her PhD. And uh, as a freelancer, I, I spend a lot of time at home and we have a studio, a shared studio. So from a relationship perspective, no problem. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, my work just dried up completely, except for on, there was a bit of a, a boost in um, live streaming for a while there. Everyone needed to, wanted to continue doing their thing with video. And the only way to do that was through live streaming. So me and a bunch of other filmmakers just bought all the live streaming gear so we could get on that train, <laughs> which we did. And there was a bit of work to be found there, but otherwise, yeah, no work to be found. Um, I was also one of the fortunate ones who, um, found it very easy to be to receive the grants from from government, so I was there was no financial hardship at all. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse okay. me, and um, and yeah, I was I kind of found it, you know, again one of the fortunate ones who was enjoying the space and enjoying being able to catch up on jobs that I hadn't had been wanting to do for a long time and tinker in the garden and. Um, tinker with my car and things like that. So um, the lockdowns were not difficult for me. Yeah. When the mandates um, were coming, what were your thoughts, early thoughts then? Well, I guess, I guess the, the pre-story to that is, is the lead up to the vaccines themselves, I suppose. So um, I was following the news, you know, typical person to find out the news scrolls right on their smartphone in the morning. And, you know, you get hand fed these stories of what's going on in the world and, um, locally and internationally. And, um, like a lot of people was very concerned with, with what was the way the, the trajectory that the, the, the virus is taking. And I was monitoring the numbers in Australia, um, and, you know, the infection rates and, and the hospitalization rates and all that stuff. And I was keeping a close eye on all that stuff. And, um, so then when the, there was talk of a vaccine, um, it seemed like this ray of hope, you know, like, so when, when there was discussion of a vaccine and I, I have had vaccines in the past, I was vaccinated as a child as we were, all were in, in the eighties. And, um, 
and more recently for international travel. And then uh, in recent years, I've even taken the plunge and had flu vaccines, which I've never done before. Um, I don't love the concept of vac vaccines, but uh, I, I've just trusted in, in the science and the experts, I suppose, and, um, and have never really had any problems. So with, with these vaccines on the way and, you know, the, the, the silver bullet as it was, um, I was kind of looking forward to it. And I put my name down for the first uh, Pfizer vaccine and, um, and got that, just a sore arm, no problems, and then waited the necessary six weeks for the second one and again received that and no problems um but uh then started to have some some problems some heart problems um how, so how long after about four days after the second yeah. injection mm -hmm. yeah so i'm not really answering your question yet but um mm. i suppose i mean the mandates i guess were not significant to me until later down the line when there was more talk of um, the third uh, dose, I suppose, because I'd had my second injection, you know, and I was up to speed with, with what I could and couldn't do. Um, so from a personal perspective, I knew that I could continue working. Um, but it did seem like I, I had this, this um, I felt sorry for the people like who, who had to get the vaccine and had legitimate stories um, for not getting it. They, they were going to lose their job because they couldn't, um, for whatever reason, get that 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 um, that vaccine. Yeah, and I still hear stories now of people who have lost their jobs and um, and they just yeah they just like life goes on for so many people you know. Mm. Um, vaccinated or, or not vaccinated but some people it's just really devastated their lives you know so i really feel for them mm. so with um yeah do you want to just talk a bit more about your injury what what you what what you experienced um after from that fourth day on yeah so i have a pre-existing condition which is only recently um, being diagnosed by a heart specialist as ventric ventricular ectopy um, which is not extremely serious at all it's um lots of people have it and they don't even know it it's just basically a um an abnormal heartbeat or uh an additional heartbeat sometimes and in my case and i've had this since I, I think since i was a kid you know but it wasn't until i was in my 20s that um i had a a, a um i was playing basketball and i had this this event that happened where I ended up in hospital and rapid heartbeat and, and all this stuff happened with my heart. And, you know, that was pretty scary, but that was like 20 years ago and nothing's really happened since then. Uh, occasionally if I've, um, if I've had too much caffeine or, uh, I'm sleep deprived or fatigued or, uh, had a bit hungover maybe, um, or and definitely if I'm anxious, I'll have this occasional kind of extra beat, you know, and it just gives you a shock, but, yeah. Um, and that might happen once a month or once a fortnight, you know, something like that. Yeah. But on the fourth day after the second Pfizer injection, it started this extra beat started happening a lot, like many times in the day. And I was aware of it, but I was like, mm, that's, that's, I don't know what that is. That's fine. And then over the following week, it got to the point where I was getting dozens of them a day. And that was okay because like I said, it's not a, it's not a serious thing. It just kind of rocks you a bit when it happens. It doesn't, doesn't generally do anything else. But in this situation, what was starting to happen was in the evenings when I'd sit down and, and relax, I'd get this, um, one of these, um, events in my heart. And following that, sometimes I would get this sharp stabbing pain in my brain <laughs> i can only describe it as in my brain there'd be this out of nowhere just bam this sharp thing in my brain which would just totally freak me out and then following that a few minutes later i would just feel overwhelmed with fatigue and um a bit nauseous and i couldn't put my words together and um i was very frightening and this wasn't just once or twice it was happening many times and in the evenings. So then it was time to, to book in with the GP and find out what's going on here, which mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. How long after your second shot did you 
see your GP? It was, um, well, I'm pretty sure there was the initial um, telehealth consultation within about three weeks, maybe. Yeah. And, and my GP recommended that I get a, an EKG and my bloods taken, which I did. And that was four weeks later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when I had, had that. That was the first kind of stage of testing. And the sharp um, uh, sensation in the head yeah. was like a shooting pain and then would disappear? Yeah, yeah. Like just totally out of... Mm -hmm. It wouldn't, wouldn't build up. It wouldn't linger. It'd just be this like lightning bolt, like a stab in my brain and usually in the same sort of area. Mm -hmm. and How long did that? go on for like um, those, those episodes yeah okay so i reckon, I reckon about four or three to four weeks um on and off and uh you know that that was really scary and um yeah the, the gp couldn't explain that and um and wasn't i think wasn't wasn't so much interested in that either it was more about the heart stuff at that point right and being someone who's very comfortable with vaccines before this moment, mm. what sort of process did you start to enter in terms of if you if you felt that this was connected to your second shot? Mm. Did you get a diagnosis? Yeah, so you know, a lot of, like a lot of people, they did a bit of research. Doctor Google comes in, you do you do your own research, and you discover that there there are. Um, Lots of, uh, or that there were some um, serious heart problems that were, um, and I think we'd heard about these in the news as well, mm. like myocarditis and and similar things. So I knew that they were around, but I hadn't heard of what I was experiencing. So I did a little bit of research, and I, I don't think it really, I wasn't really able to come up with anything. Except it, you, the the more you research, the more you start to realise that there's other stuff going on around the world that we're not hearing about, you know, and other people with. Um, different ways of approaching, uh, let's say, um, um, medicating or um, helping with um, combat the, the pandemic. Mm. The uh, the GP recommended that I see a heart. So I think I actually pushed for it. I think I said, oh, it's time I see a heart specialist because um, I think this is maybe beyond what we're, you know, we can really find out here. I need proper, proper once over, which we did book in in the end. And I did go and see um a specialist but that wasn't until early this year so months later it was just took a long time to get anything done there was a, i think the medical system was overwhelmed a little mm. and what was the outcome of that nothing except to suggest that uh i have this ventricular uh, ectopy and it's nothing to be afraid of and um i can medicate it if i want but i'm okay. not one of those people that I, i'm not on any medications at 44 and I, I don't want to be. So um, I try and find alternative ways to deal with things that the body's experiencing. Mm. So for you to sum up what you went through with, uh, after that second jab, what, how, what have you arrived at yourself with your own intuition and, and research? Um, it's Well, I went and saw a... Coincidentally, I, the same day I got the EKG, I'd booked in for the first time ever to see a traditional Chinese medicine doctor. And that was for something separate. It was for digestion, uh, nagging digestion uh, issue that I had. And and he was great. Like he, he saw things a bit differently, you know, and he was actually the guy who fixed it. He fixed it within a week. Like, um, so I'd had it, this serious condition, was well, pretty serious at times for four weeks up until that point. Saw him once and within a few days, it was disappearing a week later, it was pretty much gone. And he just used acupuncture and herbs and had a more of a holistic approach mm -hmm. to what the body was experiencing. And, you know, I'd, I've never studied medicine or anything, you know, I, I don't know a lot about that stuff, but I do listen and I do have that kind of interest in alternative ways of dealing with the body and, um, and, and understanding that, it's, that sometimes medicine, you know, chemicals aren't the way to, to, to fix things. So I guess from what he was saying, uh, he thought that it was once things get into the bloodstream, you know, it, then the liver 
has to deal with it and you know a lot of these problems are caused um, through the liver or the kidneys or you know that sort of stuff so your body has to process it and get rid of it and I think that's how he probably fixed me I'm guessing listening to your story thinking through an Australian doctor mm -hmm. who hasn't been deregistered for speaking out mm -hmm. who is we don't have um, in this country the kind of democratization of medicine that is still exists even though that's been reduced but it still exists in countries like England and the US for example mm. you can still have a doctor giving an alternative opinion in the media mm -hmm. this week we're following up on something that happened in a London hospital a few days ago the health secretary Sajid Javid was visiting and asked the group of NHS staff who were gathered to meet him what they thought of the forthcoming vaccine mandate for NHS staff. It's due to come in in April, and it will mean that medical practitioners who are not vaccinated against COVID will not be able to work in the NHS, period. One doctor, Steve James, a consultant anaesthetist at King's College Hospital, gave an answer that the minister was not expecting. Let's have a look at the clip. What do you what do you think of the the new rule to require vaccination of all NHS staff? I'm, I'm not happy about that. So you're not happy about it. Tell no. me. So I've had COVID at some point. Yeah. Uh, I've got antibodies. Yeah. Um, I've been working on COVID ITU since the beginning. Mm. I have not had a vaccination. I did not want to have a vaccination. Um, uh, the vaccine's reducing transmission only for about eight weeks mm. with Delta. With Omicron, it's probably less. Mm. And for that, I would be dismissed if I don't have a vaccine. It's not, the science isn't strong enough. Well, it's interesting you should even talk about the, um, like the deregistration of, of GPs and that sort of thing, because I have a lot of respect for my, my GP. He's, I've been with him for a long time and he's a very learned man. And I see him as a man who's run off his feet, you know, like he doesn't have a lot of time, but he does care genuinely for me. But I did my, a bit of a, a takeaway from this whole experience is not only with him, but also another a GP that I saw at that clinic, even more so was this, um, not wanting to discuss anything but the next um, vaccine you know like am i okay to get the next vaccine yes you should get the next vaccine um but what about this what about that and do you think it's this no we're not we're not there was no discussion around it you know it's not like and it, it just seemed like there was a reluctance to talk about it you know mm -hmm. um right up until the heart specialist actually who when i went back for the follow-up consultation so, didn't, I guess, come out and say, yes, the vaccine caused this to happen, but did um, say that there, there had been an overwhelming number of cases of heart incidences since Pfizer and Moderna came out, which mm. I thought then meant, okay, well, I shouldn't get the third one, right? But she's like, no, you should definitely get the third one. <laughs> so mm. I, I just, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm a rational thinker and I just don't understand the connection there, you know, and I... I want to trust. I want to trust these people because they. This is their career. This is all the research they've worked on all their professional lives, and and they're very smart people. But I just don't. I don't see that. That's helpful to me to put myself on the line to mm. go through something that was really difficult, and just with the with the idea of yes, you'll be fine. You know, don't worry about it. It's it's hard to to hear. We came across a little while ago, um, one of the largest medical insurance companies in Australia put out a statement, it was pretty much a coaching guide for doctors. We'll put a link in, um, in, this, uh, in this post so people can have a look at that for themselves. But it is pretty concerning. And even though a medical insurance company isn't setting policy, mm. it does actually set the terms of which you're you're going to be insured or not mm -hmm. um, and if you are not following the guidelines then maybe your insurance might be made redundant so there, there seems to be many mechanisms for doctors not to act scientifically mm. and not to be curious and I, I take your point about the overwhelming 
and that's a human empathy that I have for people, friends who are nurses and doctors and people in, in that industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I am also concerned that those who are left in that industry are those who didn't speak out um, and because many that did have lost their jobs or who refused to get um, even the third jab, mm-hmm. um, you know, were, were totally on board and then, well, no, I'm, I'm putting my foot down here. Yeah. So, yeah, the third jab, do you need, as in your industry, do you need to have? Well, because I'm a freelancer, it's kind of um, job by job, you know, uh, I, that I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, some workplaces require it others don't even ask whether you've had one or two you know it's a little bit like when the whole kind of uh scanning to go into a cafe or restaurant thing was around you know it's all gone now obviously and um i think it's a bit like that with workplaces too they it's sort of like well we're just moving on now we're not really worrying about that but but some some workplaces require the third dose yeah i I was having a conversation with meg this morning and we were Meg was saying, is this something we're missing here? Is that so few people want to speak about what we've just been through, particularly with the mandates, Mm. the forced or coerced experimental medical procedure. Um, The fact that it it was advertised as 95% safe and effective, that there are many people suffering as the harms of the vaccine, whether it be a milder version like yourself Mm -hmm. or quite extreme versions. We've we've, um, just spoken to Liz Mann about her story. Mm -hmm. Several months later, she is still suffering the effects, uh, completely um, negating many aspects of her life. Mm -hmm. Um, So it just seems to me that What's at stake here is the basic human right to choose one's own medicine. Mm. And for Meg and I, it's been cold water plunging for the last four years. We've taken a cold swim all through the winter, all through the year. And that's our shower. And <laughs> that's one of this morning it was zero degrees <laughs> yeah. um, and light frost on the ground. Mm. Um, in the water, zero degrees. And we, I, I, before I started doing this, I would have two or three colds a year and a flu. And I haven't had that for four years. Mm. So we've found a medicine that works. Mm. Our vaccine is cold water plunging and breath work, mm-hmm. as well as good food and um, meaningful work and things like that. Mm. And we're not saying to people, <laughs> Yeah. We would never Jump mandate cold water plunging. <laughs> but for those of us who, um, and, and our, no, no one in our family has seen a GP for five years. Um, and that's largely the way in which we cho- choose to live. Mm. It's also largely to do with some with genes, no doubt. Mm. But as I said, I, I would get regularly sick before I started doing this. So mm. even on a good diet and living in the country and doing all the physical work that that I do. Mm. So it it just it just continues to astound us that the basic human right to choose our own medicine has been taken away. Mm. And while it seems to most Australians that this is past now, what I'm deeply concerned about is how once we've capitulated on mass scale to to saying yes that's fine that hu- basic human right doesn't exist anymore mm. what is the next human right that will be taken away yeah and it happens at um it can happen at a glacial kind of rate that people won't even know yeah. um and i think even during the like the coming out of the pandemic in its in its in australia recent recent times in its worst times when we're still coming out of lockdowns and everything talking with friends about by this stage, I'd done a bit of research and was presenting um, alternative ideas to people. And just the, um, just the, the aggression and the emotion that would come from nowhere just for raising the topic, you know, I'm just want to have a discussion about this, you know, 
Um, and I've seen it with other people too, like who just want to talk about it and it's just shot down in this like vehement kind of, how dare you talk, you know, like that's, it's like a witch hunt or something, you know, mm. like you, you can't even talk about it. And that, that's what really upsets me. It's like, what, what kind of society are we living in when we can't even just have these nuanced discussions around what we're experiencing, you know, um, what my story is and what your story is, as opposed to no, you're wrong, I'm right kind of stuff. Mm. I find that really problematic going forward as well. Mm. And I think something else that just sort of thinking about what you were saying there, I, you know, and this is probably because I have suffered a little bit, but I think just there's so many people who haven't suffered that think, oh yeah, well, it all went fine. So it's all good. You know, like whatever they say we should do, we should do. But, and I suppose I've been guilty of that in the past too. You just go with the flow. If everything's working for you, then just go with it. And, maybe the problem there is that eventually one day it won't be working for you, you know, and you'll find out that you are actually one of the ones who uh, is in a bit of trouble now because the government or whoever says, no, you can't do that, you know, and your rights will be taken away from you. So I think that would be something I would want people to think about. It's like, yeah, you might be okay this time, but have a think about what's actually happening here to people, what rights are being taken away and, you know, what that might lead to in the future. It could happen to you too. Mm. And as someone who crafts media, mm -hmm. who is a storyteller, a filmmaker, a story sharer, what's your reflections on the narrative, on the, the formal narrative? Oh God, that's a, that's a pretty winding, meandering story, isn't it? It's, um, <laughs> it's like, uh, just brain vomit almost. It's like, um, it's, there's been no direction really. It just feels like even back in the early days, you know, like following following what the medical advice was, and then a month later it switched that way. And you know, even things like masks. I remember seeing a video from a prominent um, leading hospital in Melbourne saying, "No, we don't need to wear masks. You know, everything's fine." And, you know, and now obviously masks are, you know, that's that's just one little example. But mm -hmm. so things have shifted and changed, and then there was like you know, the interstate rivalry that was happening and this explosion that would happen if someone came over the borders with, with the virus and just that battle to keep zero, you know, in our state and all that stuff. And then, and now, you know, like you, you said in the start, we've just come out of an election and no one even talked about it. It's like, mm. it's all just gone and we're happy with us to move on and forget about all that. So mm. um, I think we're still too, for storytelling, for me, it's just we're too much in it still to. You need to step. You need a bit of time to look back on this and go, "What the hell was going on there?" Mm. You know, yeah. Because in the Guardian, in around October, November, twenty twenty one, there were just hit piece after hit piece on um, the great unwashed, unvaccinated filling up the hospitals, mm. and then by December, two vaccinated, fully vaccinated people brought Omicron to Australia via South Africa mm -hmm. and the Guardian reported that but there was no hit piece there mm. there was you know so we're, we're still living in the Omicron era so two fully vaccinated vaccinated people brought Omicron to Australia yeah uh, because and and documented in that same newspaper and yet great I mean I, I don't I think hit pieces are, are, are terrible mm. but you, you, so there's propaganda on one level that was amplified and then there was this sort of just this little footnote not like oh maybe we should be having a question about the efficacy of these vaccines that we have made a whole uh, subcast of people in our community mm. were vilified a whole subcast of people yeah and they're still suffering particularly in victoria yeah but but more so than that, I mean, because families are still not speaking, mm -hmm. the media gave such agency to the pro-vaccine lobby, mm -hmm. uh, unquestioned, unscientific, in my view. Mm. Um, and this is a terrible thing for science. Mm. It's, of course, a terrible thing for human rights um, and for society. Mm. I, I just see in my own circles, like... Uh... And it confuses me and upsets me that, you know, anyone who chooses not to put 
this vaccine in their body is immediately labeled and vilified. If I sympathize with them, just I'm trying to understand their position, I'm labeled and vilified. You know, there's no, there's no room seemingly for any discussion or, or nuanced debate about any of this stuff. It's just no, that's wrong. And I, I don't understand where it's come from, you know, like we can talk even more openly about religion and politics and with less vehemence, you know, but as soon as vaccination comes up, it's like there's, it's black and white, you know, seemingly. And yeah. I'm, I find that upsetting because, you know, there's history has shown that there has been mistakes in science, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and sometimes it's taken years to, to realize that, but you know, it's possible that, that that's not all what they say it is. Mm. Um, I just think it's really upsetting that, you know, in a, in this sort of, in a democratic society where we're supposed to be able to have discussions that seemingly at the moment, there's one area we can't talk about. And if you do talk about it, you immediately, your experience is shut down. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's scary and it's wrong. And I, I think we need to talk more about it and, and people should be sharing their stories, you know, like, like you are allowing them to do on this, on this show. Mm. Ibsen the playwright uh, had this quote, the majority are always wrong, the minority are rarely right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which to me is basically saying, this is the human condition. Yeah. We're mostly wrong most of the time. Yeah. But I think that that's a really apt quote for this time because I don't feel that I have the expertise to judge this. Mm. Um, I don't, but I also don't feel anybody does. Mm -hmm. And I know within the arts, there's a huge, there are huge blinders within our own areas, our own work, our own fields. So when people have said to me, do you think the entire medical profession is lying to us? Mm. I say that is, a, that's, that's, <laughs> what do I do with that question? Because yeah. of course not. I strongly believe in, in the human capacity to empathize, to care for, to reach out, to apologize, to understand our, our fragilities and our, and to be able to recognize when we're um, being uh, monsters, mm -hmm. as we all have the capacity to be very quickly in wrong relationship. Mm -hmm. But at an institutional level, I feel Australian institutions are in such wrong relationship that the people that work in them, that, you know, their whole, their mortgages or their, their food on the table is dependent on staying in those jobs. Mm. I feel like that is the more complex cultural story, yeah. that there isn't good and bad. There is just this sort of like movement down a, a particular direction that is unstoppable leading up to the 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 vaccine arriving and and then the the mandates and you know the the um the protests that were happening in the city i was a little bit on a bit confused who these people were and i did feel um a little bit of anger and resentment towards them and now that i've kind of i suffered something myself and i've heard and understand there's a, a great variety of those people protesting and, and they come from all sorts of backgrounds and have their reasons to do so and and i respect that so much more now but i've come through this process of being on that side of the fence where it's like feeling that anger and that upset at that why can't those people just follow suit and you know for the good of everyone to now recognizing that that came from a place of fear and wanting you know this is the this is the, the the choice this is the road i've taken i've taken this road of um following all the advice and uh and getting vaccinated and and i made that choice so if someone else doesn't choose that then they're wrong and i'm gonna because it's such an emotional topic and there's so much you know at stake if they've chosen the other path then my only instinct is to be angry with them and to be um and to let them know that there's it's there's never any sort of ground for discussion or or just a little bit of 
debating, you know, like mm. alternative ideas, alternative directions. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? It's no. You, I've been in workplaces where after the, the you know, some workplaces people had would lose their job after if they weren't dosed with their third dose. And I was in this particular workplace one day and um, the manager was saying that they had to let one of their workers go that day. They had, they, this person had held on until that final day and they'd lost their job that day. And, but the way the manager spoke about this person was like, you know, it was, you just don't know, you've got these crazy people working for you until you're, you know, so it's kind of good that they're gone. Yeah. And I don't know that person that lost their job. I don't know what their background is, but just to hear them in a room of other people who didn't know that person as well, just to hear them spoken of as a crazy person, it just seems really, and it was said again, this manager just said it in this way. It was knowing, you know, everyone in the room agrees with me, right? Like these are, that, that's those people and, mm. and everyone's nodding and energetically backing this person up. And I just find that stuff really ugly, you know, like there's, that person has a story. Um, who knows why they couldn't get vaccinated, why they chose not to have this vaccine put in their body. But everyone just gets on this emotional kind of attack. And mm. I find it really unsettling because I've never experienced anything like this in my, in my life before. And it, I, no way would I bring that up in as a as a, a freelance employee. Uh, I wouldn't ever raise that with, you know, the people employing me, saying, "Well, have you ever thought maybe, you know, thought of it this way?" Or like, bam, you just be shot down immediately. Mm. Can't even have that discussion. And yeah, and I'm I'm going over the same stuff over and over. But it does really really upset me. Like I, my family as well. If you're watching, which I'm sure you're not, but if you are, I love you guys. But you know, it's been raised lightly in family discussions and no one wants to hear anything about it. And it's quickly argued down emotionally. It's like, okay. The archetypal response to crisis is to the creation of a scapegoat mm. um, that seems to be seminal somehow to our species. Um, and, and through the creation of a scapegoat, the fear and the crisis is allayed because there is an enemy that um, can be hated on mm -hmm. and all of that big emotion can be pointed at. And there's many writers like Charles Eisenstein who have articulated that um, much more eloquently mm -hmm. over, the, over COVID, but I feel like there's such big lessons in this time and we're going to see more rupture. I uh, am just so thankful to have hear your story because, um, yeah, just to, to hear that sort of unfolding um, from someone who really believed the science was in, in terms of the vaccines, mm. and then to this gentle place of questioning, which makes sense, and then this sort of this this call for um, understanding and discussion. Mm. What do you hope for in say your peer group in your your friendship group? I just friendship groups, family groups, workplace groups. I just think people need to be more gentle with each other and um, and not so um, presumptive. Um, allow people to tell their story and um not vilify them you know don't pigeonhole them try and break down those those shackles that seemingly we've we've all kind of built up of of just this right and wrong black and white um it's such a an unknown time that we're living in and i would want people to be more accepting of others i suppose and their story Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> Thanks so much for speaking to us today, Dave. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Peace.